Hi folks, welcome back to History One, the history of Christian thought and practice one. This is Highlights from Unit 3. And don't forget the textbook for this course is Reading the Church Fathers. This is the 2022 version from Sophia Institute Press. Uh, there is an older book out there by me with a slightly different title. Don't get that one. It is outdated. This is the revised edition, Reading the Church Fathers, A History of the Early Church and the Development of Doctrine. Now, if you've stumbled on this video and you're not in my class, that's fine. You are welcome to watch. I hope you do. The outro at the end of the video is for you, not for my students. Um, but the rest of what I will say is geared toward the students who are taking the class and who are doing the readings. Now, we've got two main topics to cover today. The first is the topic of the apologists. And the apologists are kind of that next generation, uh, maybe we might call them the third generation of leaders and theologians and catechists in the early church. The first generation would be the apostles, and then the second generation would be their disciples, whom we sometimes refer to as the apostolic fathers or the elders. Um, and then we've got the apologists. And these folks are in the mid to late second century, and they are, they are generally philosophers who have made the decision that Christianity is the best philosophy, and they are teaching Christianity as a philosophy, and they are writing apologies, not to say they're sorry, but apologetics, um, and they're, they're meant to be written, the, these, uh, these apologies are written for a non-Christian audience. They're written to tell people outside the church what the church is like, the fact that the church is not subversive against the government, it's not dangerous, um, they're not plotting against the emperor, nothing like that, but also to explain who the Christians are and what they do. The main apologist that we're going to look at, and the one uh, that, that you're going to read if you haven't already, is Justin Martyr. Now, as you might guess, Martyr is not his last name, right? But it is a title given to him because he was martyred. He was executed for the faith. And of course, so were a lot of other people, and I don't honestly know why he gets the last name Martyr and they don't, but at any rate, remember our conversation about how the uh, the patron client system, that, that networking system within Roman culture, how that kind of uh, influences the church in a certain way. Remember that the host of a house church would be seen as the patron of that congregation. Well, if, if that person was martyred, um, or in, in fact, if anyone in a particular congregation was martyred, and you were talking to somebody who was also Christian, but not from that house church or that congregation, uh, you might refer to your congregation as the Church of the Holy Martyr Justin, for example, uh, which eventually sort of becomes St. Justin Martyr's Church. And this is how we get the idea of churches dedicated to the saints, because originally the saints are all martyrs, right? But even beyond that, these martyrs who are seen as someone who, they're not dead, they're more alive than ever, and they're with Christ. They have Jesus's ear. And so who better to pray for us than those martyrs who are in heaven for sure with God? And so the saints themselves become patrons through their intercession. And, and so this is the, uh, the origin of the concept of the intercession of the saints. The saints become our patrons in heaven as they pray for us. And we know this was going on from the very beginning of the church because we have it in graffiti as well as in documents. In the catacombs, we have graffiti that say things like, Peter and Paul, pray for me. Mary, pray for me. And then we have documents as well that, that show that this was going on. We, we actually have a prayer to Mary from the third century that, that refers to her as the mother of God and as our patron. And so, um, so this, this is going on. And, and so Justin Martyr gets this title of martyr, even though he's clearly not the only one. 
Now, when you read Justin Martyr's first apology, uh, one of the things I want you to, to really see, and, and it's impossible not to see it, it's going to jump right off the page, is what looks like the earliest sort of order of worship that we have. Now, first thing to say is this is not an order of worship because this is not a church order manual. Justin is not writing a manual for how to do liturgy. So this is not an order of worship, right? But we don't really have anything earlier that shows us what Christian worship looked like. And so in Justin Martyr's Apology, he is writing, he's actually writing an open letter to the emperor to say, here's what we do when we gather for worship. Now, I assume that this is a morning liturgy. He doesn't actually say that, but it must be because Two generations earlier, we have that letter from the governor Pliny to the emperor Trajan. And Pliny basically says that because of one of Trajan's laws against the meeting of secret societies, um, he has suppressed the evening meetings of the church, right? And so uh, in, in many places, Christians simply are not able to meet in the evenings for liturgy, Maybe in some places they're still getting away with meeting for the evening meal, and we know that the agape meal continues on without the Eucharist in it for a while. Um, in some places and at some times, they're having those, uh, those meetings out in the cemeteries, in other places and times, in people's homes. Um, but at some point, the Eucharist itself has been removed from the evening agape meal, and it has become... A morning liturgy, uh, focusing primarily on Sunday morning, as Justin tells us, but that doesn't necessarily mean it was only on Sunday morning. And it seems like, uh, for the most part, the the assumption is that if if you can, the Eucharist should be offered every day, uh, if if at all possible. The other thing we have is is Saint Paul's critique of the way people were abusing the agape meal. This is in First Corinthians eleven, where um, you know, former pagans coming into the church are now treating the agape meal with, with the Eucharist uh, like it's some Roman banquet. And, you know, the wealthy people are eating all the good food before the, you know, the poor people who work all day get there. And, uh, you know, they're drunk by the time the Eucharist comes around. And so, so Paul critiques this. And this may also be one of the reasons why the Eucharist was, was taken out of the evening meal and it becomes a morning liturgy. And, um, and and so so what we see is really two things happening. We see the Eucharist become a, uh, a a liturgy primarily on Sunday mornings, and then we see it also continuing um, out at the tombs in, in the cemeteries in Rome at the catacombs, and uh, and and the the Christians continued the Roman tradition of the memorial meal at the burial sites of especially the martyrs, but but all of their Christian loved ones. And uh, when they could have a priest come out to celebrate the Eucharist, sometimes the Eucharist was literally celebrated on the top of the person's sarcophagus in a mausoleum or in the catacombs. And the sarcophagus lid became the Eucharistic table. And, and spoiler alert, that is going to continue when... Uh, the church is finally able to build church buildings specifically for worship. The altar, the main altar table of those churches is going to be constructed still directly over the tombs of the martyrs. And sometimes the tomb is brought up from below, still directly over the site where it was, but then the sarcophagus itself or the tomb itself becomes the altar and the top is the table and the Eucharist is celebrated right there on the tomb of a martyr, which, which demonstrates this really intimate connection between um, death and eternal life and the hope of resurrection and what's going on in the Eucharist, which is, of course, um, a, a miracle that is uh, another incarnation of the body and blood of Christ representing the passion of Christ in the sacrament. So all of this is going on while the Christians are also looking forward in anticipation to the great heavenly banquet 
Um, so all of that is going on in the Eucharist, and it's all sort of uh, architecturally there in the sacred space where the martyrs were buried. And so Justin Martyr and others would be someone whose tomb would be revered, whose, whose relics, which that word relic is just the from the Latin word for remains, whose remains would would make the place where they are to be holy ground. And because the early Christians uh, believed in this, this eternal connection between a person's body, body and soul, even when they're separated uh, through physical death, between the time of death and the resurrection, they're still connected. And so to be at the site where the, the, the remains of a saint, of a, of a martyr are buried, to be close to the martyr's remains is to be close to God because the martyr is with God and that martyr becomes our heavenly patron who prays for us. And so all of this was practiced by the early Christians. All of that is to say that when you read Justin Martyr's document, he has some things to say about the Eucharist and about how it's celebrated that I want you to pay attention to. And, um, you know, you can't help but notice just how much his description of liturgy looks like you know, what we still do, those of us who are in more liturgical traditions, it looks exactly like what we still do. Uh, he's, he's got it all in there. He's got a sermon. He's got, the, they take the offering, all of it. The only thing Justin Martyr doesn't mention is singing, but we know that they were singing from other documents. Um, in fact, even that, that, that letter from the pagan governor Pliny to the emperor Trajan talks about how the Christians were singing hymns to Christ as to a God. So we know that hymn singing was, of course, part of early liturgy as well. But, um, you know, assuming that's in there too, take a look at what Justin gives us as a description of how Christians worship. And remember that this is coming from the middle of the second century. Okay, now Justin also talks about what Christians believe about God. In other words, that God is a trinity. And we've touched on this a little bit before, um, but again, notice that it is always assumed that there is some kind of hierarchy in the trinity. And um, you know, this is referred to it at this stage in the development of doctrine. This is referred to as the economy in the trinity. Uh, it comes from a Greek word that um, it's related to, uh, you know, the idea of a household structure. Um, but uh, you'll notice that Justin Martyr will say things like, the Father takes the first place, the Son takes the second place, the Holy Spirit takes the third place. So not only do we have God as a trinity, but there is a hierarchy in the trinity. Now, keep in mind, this is not a, an ontological hierarchy. It is not a hierarchy of being. Um, all three persons of the Trinity are not only equally divine, but simply one divinity, right? Uh, they're not even three equal divinities. They are one divinity. So absolute equality there. Um, and, uh, and, and in fact, all of the divine attributes that we've talked about, uh, divine power, uh, omnipotence, uh, omnipresence, omniscience, omnibenevolence, uh, immutability, impassibility, perfection, simplicity, all of these divine attributes, these are attributes that describe divinity itself. And so therefore, these are not things that are that exist kind of in a hierarchy of the three persons. The three persons share all of these attributes absolutely equally because there is really only one of all of these attributes and the three persons of the Trinity are that one divinity, right? So if it's if it's not an ontological hierarchy, if it's not a hierarchy of of divinity or power or anything like that, and it's not, then what kind of hierarchy is it, right? Well, it's it's a kind of hierarchy of authority. Uh, as long as we as long as we separate authority as something different from raw power, right? It's the hierarchy of authority that that is presented to us in Scripture as a distinction between sender and messenger. The father is the sender, the son is the messenger, and then later the son becomes 
sender and the spirit is messenger, or the father and son together are sender uh, and the spirit is messenger. But the point is, is that this is a hierarchy of authority. It is the father's message that the son brings. And so any in any hierarchy of sender and messenger, the sender is the sender is higher in the hierarchy than the messenger. The messenger brings the sender's message, not his own. Now, with Jesus, it's a bit of a paradox because there is a sense in which he, he comes with his own authority as well. And he'll say that on occasion. Um, he doesn't have to quote previous rabbis or anything like that. Um, but, but ultimately, he comes with the Father's authority. Uh, he brings the Father's message, right? And so, uh, so, so this, this is a hierarchy of sender and messenger. But don't get the idea that this hierarchy only exists during the time of the Incarnation or, or only exists perhaps from our perspective. That's not the case. The hierarchy is an eternal and internal aspect of the divine trinity because there's a sense in which the son and the spirit are dependent on the father for their very existence even in a way that is not reciprocal right uh, the father is not dependent on the son or the spirit we say that the father alone is the first cause it's a philosophical term but meaning the ultimate source of all existence the son is a source of existence the son is creator all things were created through him, John 1, but in a, in a way that the Son is the agent of creation. The Father is the ultimate source of creation. The Son is the agent of creation. Also, the Father alone is unbegotten in his existence. There is He has no cause to his existence. And yet the Son and the Spirit, uh, the Son is begotten and the Spirit proceeds. So again, their existence is in a certain way caused and in a certain way contingent on the Father. Not in a chronological sense. It does not mean that the Father came first and the Son came later. Nothing like that. All three are equally eternal because all three are equally divine. And yet, there is an eternal dependency of the Son and the Spirit on the Father in a way that's not reciprocal. And so here we have the... Um, the foundation of this hierarchy of sender and messenger in the relationships of the Trinity, that the Son is begotten of the Father, but the Father is not begotten of anybody because the Father is unbegotten. The Spirit proceeds, right? So you see how um, the, the differences between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have to do primarily with the relationships between them. But uh, beyond that, then the, all of those attributes of God that we've talked about at the beginning of the course are, uh, are absolutely equal. And so this is not an ontological hierarchy. It is not a hierarchy of divinity or of power, but it is a hierarchy of authority based on the relationships within the Trinity. Now, I need to point out that uh, just because I'm talking about this stuff with regard to Justin Martyr and his comments on the Trinity, I want you to pay attention to that. But remember, the idea of the Trinity is not new. Um, it's been around since the beginning, since you know Jesus himself said, uh, we read it in Matthew 28, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So Jesus himself understood God as a Trinity he, um, he knew who the Father is, he understood himself to be the Son in that relationship, and he knew who the Holy Spirit is. So God has been a Trinity from the beginning. This is not a later development. Um, we don't quite have the word Trinity yet, because our English word Trinity comes from the Latin word Trinitas, and we haven't met our first Latin theologian yet, everybody's still writing in Greek, but in Greek, uh, their word for Trinity is triados, triad. So even though they don't quite have the word Trinity yet, uh, they are calling God uh, the divine triad. And so the, the doctrine of the Trinity, the concept of the Trinity is not new, but in the development of doctrine, it is becoming clarified little by little over time.
Okay, now I just want to mention one of the other apologists who kind of bridges the gap between Justin Martyr and our first theologians who are, well, we'll talk about Irenaeus of Lyon. Um, and, and so this other apologist is uh, this guy, Athenagoras of Athens. And uh, I just want to mention him right now because in his document called A Plea for the Christians, which is another apologetic document, um, sort of defending Christianity against uh, enemies outside the church and against antagonistic emperors, etc. So in this document, A Plea for the Christians, Athenagoras too mentions the Trinity. And he, he has this comment that he just kind of throws out there. And, and by the way, it's important that he just can throw out this comment without feeling like he has to explain it, um, justify it, or defend it, right? Because what that means is, is that he doesn't anticipate there's going to be any objection to it. It's just kind of already out there. But it's one of the first places where we get anyone actually saying this. He says, we acknowledge a God, and by that he means the first person of the Trinity, the Father, and a Son, his Logos, and a Holy Spirit. Now, if you just had that, you might think, well, wait a minute, it sounds like this is not a Trinity, that he's that he's talking about God only in reference to the Father, and the Son is something else, and the Holy Spirit is something else. Um, because his language here isn't, isn't quite that refined with regard to the Trinity, right? But watch what he says next. He says, we acknowledge a God and his son, uh, and a son, his logos, and a Holy Spirit, united in essence, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. And that little phrase, united in essence, uh, is extremely important because, because what, he's, what he's hit on here, and again, without feeling like he has to defend it or explain it or justify it, um, is that all three persons of the Trinity are the same essence, Right? are the same essence. And I know you, some of you might be wondering, well, wait a minute, what does essence mean? And I'm going to get to that in a minute. But the reason why I want to bring this up now is because uh, when we get to Irenaeus of Lyon, he is going to clarify this even further. He's going to build on this idea. And Irenaeus is really, I think, the first person to, um, to, to really clarify this concept of a single divine essence. And so we'll talk about that when we get there, but here it is already. Okay, so Athenagoras says that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are united in essence. What does he mean by essence? Now this comes from a Greek word, ousia, and um, it, the essence of something is exactly what you'd think. It is, it is the core of a thing. The essence of something is what makes it what it is. And so um, the, the essence of a thing is, is that without which it would not be that thing. Um, so, you know, the, the essence of who I am remains the same no matter what shirt I'm wearing uh, from one day to the next. The shirt is not the essence of me, um, but the essence of me is the core of me. It's what makes me me. Now, um, when you again, when you think back to all of the attributes of divinity that we've studied, omnipotence, omniscience, uh, omnipresence, omnibenevolence, immutability, impassibility, simplicity, perfection, eternality, all of those things are descriptors of the essence of divinity, the very essence of God, what makes God God is those things. And in fact, the church fathers would say, it's not even that God has uh, immutability or impassibility. It's that God simply is immutability, impassibility, simplicity, etc. So the essence of divinity, the essence of godness, uh, what, what makes God God is all of that stuff, and that, and when we talk about what divinity is, that is what is the essence of divinity. Now, when you take that concept of essence and translate it into Latin, we, we get a word, substantia, which we then translate into English as substance. 
So another word in English for essence is substance. But be careful. It doesn't mean a tangible substance. Um, you know, we're talking about intangibles here. We're talking about uh, spiritual substances, if you will, that, that can only be seen with the eyes of faith, as the church fathers would say. And so um, substance is another word for essence, but it does not mean material substance or, or tangible substance, right? So the substance of divinity is the same thing as the essence of divinity. Now, I want to define uh, two more terms for you. One is nature. What is the nature of a thing? And actually, this word is also synonymous with essence and substance. So the nature of God is all of those attributes again. The essence of, of divinity is the substance of God, is God's nature, right? We don't usually use the word nature for the, the Trinity per se. We usually reserve the word nature for the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, who has two natures, right? He has a divine nature, which is the same divinity as the Father and the Spirit. It's not, it's not a different divinity, it's the like same divinity. But Jesus also has a human nature, which is the same humanity as the rest of us. And we'll definitely talk more about that later. But the point is, is that when we say Jesus has two natures, we are saying Jesus has two substances or essences, right? Uh, and, and of course, you know, we're going to unpack this later where we have to be careful. We don't turn him into somebody with multiple personalities. But the point is, is that in the one person of Jesus Christ, there are two natures. Uh, finally, the word form. Uh, in, some, in some context, the word form can also mean the same thing as essence, substance, or nature. So, for example, when St. Paul says in Philippians 2, he was in the form of God, that is Paul saying that the second person of the Trinity, the divine Logos, starts out with the same divinity as God the Father. Same divinity. So, the whole point of Philippians 2 is Jesus starts out as God and becomes human, not the other way around, right? Uh, so, in that context, form can also mean the same thing as essence or substance or nature. But usually, when we talk about, uh, about God as Trinity, we say that the three persons of the Trinity, and, and by the way, we use the word persons as a technical term. Um, let's, uh, let's try to reserve persons for the persons of the Trinity. And when we talk about a bunch of regular humans, let's use the word people. Um, Let's, let's not say, you know, uh, there are 10 persons in this room because, uh, well, that's terrible grammar, but also because, it, you know, we want to reserve the word persons, at least for my class, we want to reserve the word persons for the three persons of the Trinity. It's a technical term. Uh, when there's a bunch of humans in a room, we just say there are 10 people in the room, just say people. It's a regular word. That everybody knows. Okay, so when we talk about the Trinity, we say that God is three persons in one substance, or or at this point in the history, one essence, because we're still in Greek, right? Essence is Greek, substance is Latin. Um, God is three persons with one essence or substance. The second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, is one person with two natures. All right, we're definitely going to unpack that more as we go, but that's good for now. Okay, now we come to our second topic, which is Irenaeus of Lyon, and uh, you're going to read his shorter document. We have we have two primary documents from him, Against Heresies, which is, which is really very long, and if you're interested in detailed descriptions of the different Gnostic schools of thought, that's where you go for that. But I'm not going to make you read that. You're reading a, a, a document that's uh, called Demonstration of the Apostolic Preaching or Proof of the Apostolic Teaching or some combination of those words in English. Um, Irenaeus is really our first, I think, real theologian. And, uh, you know, definitely look in the textbook where I talk about, you know, well, what is the difference between an apologist and a theologian? Um, but for right now, I'll just remind you that an apologist 
is usually writing for an audience outside the church to explain or justify or defend Christianity to non-Christians. A theologian is writing to Christians uh, to teach the faith, but also to warn them against uh, incorrect interpretations or heresies, right? And there's, there's something that happens, I think, at about the end of the second century, last couple decades of the second century. We actually have two documents that uh, that provide us with beautiful summaries of the sort of state of the art of Christian theology up until that point. And if you think about it, we're getting to the point where it's about a century after the uh, you know the the last of the documents of the New Testament. Now, a hundred years have gone by, and now we get these two beautiful documents, um, one by Irenaeus and one by Clement of Alexandria, that really give us a, a great summary of what Christians believe and how they explain it at this point in the church's history. Um, the, the document by Clement of Alexandria is, and I have to look here, Exhortation to the Greeks. Again, I, I'm not assigning that to you, but if you want, uh, if you wanted a great summary, uh, in addition to Irenaeus's document of, of Christian doctrine at this point, um, you can check it out. Uh, the one I've asked you to read is Irenaeus's document, which is, I think, better, but they're both great. And, um, and, and again, Irenaeus gives us, in this shorter of his documents, um, a, a beautiful summary of Christian teaching up to this point, right? And uh, as I say, you know, in the book, perhaps Irenaeus's greatest contribution to the development of doctrine at this point is that that he is able to flesh out and maybe explain a little bit more and, and build on what we already saw in Athenagoras, right? That the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are all one essence, or uh, in Latin, one substance. And we, we have a, a doctrine now, we call it consubstantiality. Consubstantiality is the doctrine that all three persons of the Trinity are consubstantial. And if you, uh, if, if, if you say the same translation of the Nicene Creed in your liturgy as we do, you know you say that word consubstantial every week. In the Creed, it's a reference to the consubstantiality of the Son with the Father, that the Father and the Son are the same substance or the same essence. But of course, it applies to the Holy Spirit too. Um, it just doesn't quite say that in the creed, uh, but it, it does not in so many words in the third paragraph of the creed that was added uh, a little while later. So it's in there, but the, the point is, is that you know we have this doctrine and we have a name for it. It is the doctrine of consubstantiality, but the church fathers didn't quite call it that, but they, they, they had it. They knew it, they understood it, and here we're going to see Irenaeus, who is going to clarify it. And so I'm going to read, actually, just a short paragraph from uh, Irenaeus's Proof of the Apostolic Preaching, or Demonstration of the Apostolic Teaching, depending on your translation. Uh, but this is paragraph 47, and this is what he says. He says, Therefore, the Father is Lord, and the Son is Lord, and the Father is God, and the Son is God. For he who is born of God is God, and thus God is shown to be one according to the essence of his being and power. But at the same time, as the administrator of the economy of our redemption, he is both Father and Son. Since the Father of all is invisible and inaccessible to creatures, it is through the Son that those who are to approach God must have access to the Father. So you see what Irenaeus is saying here. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all of one essence, one divine substance, one single divinity. And yet there is still this hierarchy, and, and the way he describes it is it's a kind of a hierarchy of accessibility. The Father is less accessible to us as humans than the Son, so if we want to um, get to the Father, we have to get to the Father through the Son, which is, of course, exactly what the Apostle John tells us in the fourth gospel anyway. Um, but I want you to notice uh, that uh, Irenaeus's 
sort of justification or explanation of the doctrine of consubstantiality is this phrase, he who is born of God is God. And that phrase, born of God there, that's, a, again, an English translation to sort of render the concept of being begotten, what it means to be begotten, that the Son is the only begotten of the Father, right? Well, the fact that he is begotten means that he, he is, that his very existence is kind of an extension of the existence of the Father in a way that makes his existence dependent upon the Father and contingent upon the Father and, and that makes... Uh, that, that makes the Father sort of the, the cause of his existence. Again, not in a chronological sense, not in the sense that the Father came first and the Son came later, not like that, but in the sense of a kind of dependency that is not reciprocal. The Father is not dependent on the Son in the way that the Son is dependent on the Father. And the Father is never the messenger of the Son in the way that the Son is the messenger of the Father. And so, uh, he who is begotten of God is God. And, you know, sometimes I like to explain this, uh, like, you know, whatever is born of a, of a dog is a dog. Whatever is born of a cat is a cat. Um, you know, dogs don't have kittens uh, and, and cats don't have puppies, right? So there, there's a consistency in the, the substance of being. And I know that's a, that's a terrible analogy. And so forgive me. Uh, but you get the idea, right, that whoever is begotten of God must be a chip off the old divine block, right? Must be also God, not less God. So again, chip off the block, not a great analogy. Um, but as I always say, analogies are fine as long as you realize none of them are perfect. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what Irenaeus gives us as the sort of state of the art of Christian theology at the end of the second century. Okay, now for this, I want to uh, make sure that you look at the chart on uh, page 194 of this book. Um, you've got a chart that's uh, titled something like Theology and Christology in the Second Century. Uh, page 194 of this book, check out that chart. Um, it does what I always do with the kind of three columns, and this is based on the three laws, right? Uh, heresy forces orthodoxy to define itself, and then law two, uh, orthodoxy is the middle way between the extreme alternatives. And so you see the two columns on the outer side uh, give you the extreme alternatives or the heresies with orthodoxy in the middle. So, so make sure you check out that chart. And... Um, and, you know, at this stage in the second century, right, we've got uh, heresies that, that mostly are about the person of Jesus Christ and about his two natures. Uh, specifically, the heresies deny one or the other of Christ's two natures. So when we talk about Christ having two natures, divine and human, heresy is trying to choose one and leave the other behind whereas orthodoxy is, is going to be always the sort of both-and answer to the question. This obviously has implications for the Trinity, um, and we're going to see very similar heresies that apply more to the, the Trinity, but at this stage, it's mostly about Christology, and it's mostly about the two natures of Christ. All right, so, for example, on one extreme, you have the Judaizers and the Ebionites. Now, to be fair... These guys are trying to protect monotheism, right? They, they know, rightly so, that, um, that, that Christianity must remain true to the monotheistic roots of Judaism. In other words, there can be only one God. Now, to them, the idea of worshiping Jesus feels like two gods. And so their solution to the problem is to say that God is one, because Jesus is not God. And so Jesus is one of us, but not unique among us, and um, he, he's, not, he, he's not divine at all. And, uh, you know, this, this solution to the problem is still around. It, it, we can still see this in modern groups like uh, the Unitarians, for example. And I'm not, you know, um, 
trash-talking Unitarians, I mean, uh, they'd be the first to admit that they are called Unitarians because they're not Trinitarian, right? And so uh, the, the solution there is to diminish or deny the divinity of Jesus in order to try to protect the oneness of God. Uh, that is not the solution that the mainstream church took, and that is not the solution that we define as orthodoxy or correct doctrine. Now, on the other extreme, you have the Docetics and the Gnostics. So, if the Judaizers and the Ebionites are folks who came in from Judaism, converted to Christianity, but couldn't quite let go of all of the Judaism, right? The Docetics and the Gnostics are folks who came in from polytheism and maybe converted to Christianity, but couldn't quite let go of all their polytheism. And so, to them, monotheism is not that much of a priority. They're not worried about whether or not they're going to be monotheists. They are simply willing to see Jesus as one of many gods. Not even just two gods, but many gods. And as, as Gnosticism develops, it's more and more and more gods until at its peak, I think you have 365 gods. Um, but, the, but the point of that is the Docetic and Gnostic solution to the question of whether or not Jesus is, you know, divine or human or both, their solution is to say that he's divine, but not really human, because they, they have a, a sensibility about divinity that um, they couldn't believe that divinity could become incarnate, that divinity could become human, right? To say the word became flesh sounds to a docetic or a Gnostic like you're saying the good became evil, right? And they, they, they couldn't believe it. And so um, they basically held on to a lot of aspects of their polytheism, that there are many gods, that there are degrees of divinity, some gods are more divine than others, and even that gods are not necessarily eternal, that they can have a beginning to them. So two gods, a god and a goddess, can get together and have a baby god, and gods can procreate, and, um, and, and all of this. And the interesting thing about this is, that while the Judaizers and, and the Ebionites had said that Jesus is not really unique among us, he's just one of us, the Docetics and Gnostics would say that also Jesus is not really unique among us, um, but it wasn't because they believed Jesus was a mere human. It was because they believed Jesus was a god, and they would say, we are all gods too, or at least the elites among them would claim to be gods trapped in a body of flesh, and so for them, the body is bad, and uh, the goal of salvation is to escape the prison of the flesh. And so there's this real dualism. Everything created is bad. Everything spiritual is good, right? And in fact, uh, this kind of uh, docetic or Gnostic belief is also still around. There's nothing new under the sun. And so anytime you see a kind of mind over matter spirituality, anytime you see a spirituality that has this, this dualistic assumption that, that only what is spiritual is good and what is material is inherently evil, anytime you see something like this, you're, you're, you're seeing a form of Gnosticism. And I think we see this in um, old school Christian science. I think we see it in the New Age movement and, uh, and, in, and currently in Scientology. I mean, these are the kinds of things uh, that, that have real affinities with, um, you know, what existed on the fringes of the early church, this docetism and this Gnosticism. Okay, so orthodoxy then is this middle way, the, the both-and answer to the question. Jesus Christ is and must be both human and divine, fully human like us, but also fully divine, as divine as the Father is, and in fact, not simply just an equal divinity, but the same divinity. Okay, so at this stage in the development of doctrine, what we have here is what we call Logos Christology, the Christology that Jesus Christ is the divine Logos, which is that Greek word for word. He is the divine word who became human, who became incarnate. And as I mentioned earlier, um, we know from Philippians 2 that uh, he didn't start out human and become divine somehow. He starts out divine and becomes 
human. We, we refer to this as a Christology of descent. And this is extremely important because that's what the incarnation is. It is a Christology of descent. Jesus descends from the divine realm to the human realm, not giving up his divinity. He remains fully divine at all times, but he acquires alongside that divinity a humanity, a human nature as well. So I'm going to go through here sort of the main points of what we know so far, and uh, I'm going to do it a little bit quickly, but you can always stop the video and go back. Um, but uh, here's what we know so far. First of all, Jesus Christ is not simply pre-existent. In other words, he's not just the divine Logos who existed before uh, he became human. That is true, but he's also eternal. He is eternally pre-existent. And in fact, the church fathers would read the Old Testament and they would they would see those, those theophanies, those appearances of the divine when Old Testament patriarchs see God. Um, and I'm thinking here of like uh, Abraham and uh, he has those three mysterious visitors. And one of those three visitors is described as being uh, like God and he is worshiped and he makes promises in the name of God and he's this divine presence. And the, the early church fathers read that and said, yes, that is the pre-incarnate logos, the word of God showing up at points in the Old Testament uh, even before his incarnation. So, so Jesus Christ as the divine word is preexistent. He existed before his incarnation, but even eternally preexistent. Uh, that is, he is as eternal as the Father, because if they are the same divinity, same substance, they must also be the same eternity, right? And, um, and by the way, that, um, that passage in, I, I think it's Genesis 18, where uh, Abraham has these three visitors, it's a much, much later interpretation of that to say that those three visitors are the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The original interpretation of that was that uh, two of them are angels. And in fact, in the next chapter, it actually says two of them are angels. But the third one, who is not described as an angel, that is the second person of the Trinity. And that's how um, the church fathers interpreted that. Okay, so in the incarnation, Jesus Christ acquires a human nature. Now, I want to mention a couple things about what a human nature is. On the one hand, right, a human nature is exactly that which we all have. And we, we do a lot of sort of uh, defining ourselves or identifying ourselves these days according to things that, that separate us or make us different from each other. But to think of what a human nature is, I want you to think in terms of, a, of, of what I call an anthropology of unity. What a human nature is, is exactly what we all share what makes us all alike as humans. And that's what Jesus became. That's what's important. Jesus became exactly what is to be like all of us, right? Now, on the other hand, um, you know, we are all, all, the, all of us, all of you listening to this, me, we're all sinners. But be careful. Sin is not a part of the essence of human nature. So, when we say Jesus, uh, you know, perhaps was tempted in all things like us, uh, but he didn't sin, right? And I'm badly quoting Hebrews there, but but the point is, is that when I say Jesus became like us in every way, he certainly did face temptations, but he never gave into them. He never sinned. And I know that that for some people, there's a temptation there, which is to say, well, you know, if Jesus didn't sin, he wasn't really human. That's not correct. Jesus was really human, and in fact, by not sinning, he realized his full humanity better than any of the rest of us, because to sin is not part of the essence of humanity. To sin is to fall short of what real humanity ought to be. So Jesus um, really fully realized the full potential of his humanity. So he came to be uh, a human in, in a way that is exactly like all of us, but sin is not an, a part of the essence of human nature, and so he had no sin, and yet he was still 
fully human, right? Uh, the other thing we have to remember about the incarnation is that it is absolutely voluntary, right? Um, that language in Philippians 2 about how uh, he emptied himself to become human, that is a self-limiting. Now, keep in mind, he did not empty himself of divinity, right, or anything like that, but he emptied himself in a way that he was willing to self-limit and set aside for the time of his earthly ministry, set aside certain uh, divine attributes, which would make it difficult for him to experience the human condition. Like, for example, if you're omnipresent, right, it's hard to experience what it's like to be a human. And so uh, if you're omniscient, it's hard to experience what it's like to be a human. And so even Jesus himself says, when they ask him, you know, when are you going to return? He's like, well, the Father knows, but at this moment, I don't know. And so he's willing to self-limit. Now, uh, only a divine being can self-limit in these ways because the rest of us are, are constrained. We don't have the choice to not be limited by our human nature. Um, but Jesus, because he started out divine, uh, for him to be limited was a choice and it was voluntary. And so it's because he's divine that the self-limiting is voluntary because nobody can force him to do anything. He's, he's God, but at the same time, because he's divine, he paradoxically had the power to self-limit in this way. And so this is where we get the church fathers saying things like, the impassable became passable for our sake. In the incarnation, the omnipresent became localized, circumscribed, right? Um, uh, contained within time and space for our sake as, as, a, as an aspect of the incarnation. And yet, all of this time, right, Jesus Christ retains his two natures. He is always fully divine, never gives up any divinity. His divinity is never diminished. And he acquires this human nature, right? So before the incarnation, before the moment of his conception, he was only divine. He had only the divine nature. At the moment of his conception, he acquires a human nature. And that never goes away. He does not stop being human at his ascension. He doesn't shed his humanity and go back to being divine only. He does not do that. His human nature is immortal or eternal into the future. Uh, and so he exists even now and forever in both of his natures because, as we're going to find out as we go through this, both of his natures are required for salvation. And here we're going to see the seeds being planted of our theories of atonement that we're going to study later. But the point is, is that even now, the church fathers know that Jesus Christ must be human. He must be one of us in order to die for us, in order to save us. But of course, he must be divine in order to be able to save anybody, to be able to save at all. So he must be both one of us and also unique among us. He must be one of us in order to represent us on the cross, but he has to be unique among us because he has to be, um, you know, without sin so that he doesn't have his own sins to overcome. And he also has to have this divine nature in order to have the power to overcome death. And so he has to have both natures or salvation doesn't work. So tuck that away for later because we're going to be circling back to that when we get to salvation, the third law. Christology informs soteriology and our doctrines of atonement. Okay, um, we've talked about the doctrine of consubstantiality, that uh, all three persons of the Trinity are the one divinity, which means that it is appropriate to worship the Son and the Spirit. And it is appropriate to ask them to intervene with divine power on our behalf. It is appropriate to recite creeds or statements of faith that, that center on all three persons of the Trinity. It, and it is, it is appropriate to conduct sacraments in the name of Jesus Christ. And, and all three persons of the Trinity are involved in those sacraments. And it's appropriate to sing hymns um, that proclaim the divinity of all three persons of the Trinity. Now, with, with the thing about hymns, uh, you can sing songs about people who aren't 
divine, and it's not necessarily an act of worship or idolatry. I mean, you know, nobody thought that the ballad of Davy Crockett was worshiping Davy Crockett. And so in the same way, we can sing hymns about other important figures like Mary without ascribing any divinity to her or without lapsing into worship of her. But when we ascribe divinity, when we ascribe divine power, it is appropriate to, uh, to, to, to sing and pray to all three persons of the Trinity in that way, right? So in this way, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all consubstantial, are all the one God, and yet we can't blur the distinction between them. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father, etc. So we are going to have to clarify the distinctions between them. What is it about the Father that's not the Son? And what is it about the Son that's not the Father? And that we'll get to that. Um, but what we're going to see when we clarify these things is that we're always after a kind of balance of both unity and distinction, both in the Trinity, between the three persons of the Trinity, and within the person of Christ, between the two natures. So with regard to the three persons of the Trinity, we always want to balance the oneness of the Trinity with the threeness of the three persons. With the, uh, with the person of Christ, we are always going to want to balance the oneness of the person with the fact that he has two natures and not blur the distinction between the two natures. So that's always going to be our goal. Neither, never the either or answer to the question, but always the both and answer to the question. Always maintaining the integrity of the distinction between the three persons or between the two natures, yet while always maintaining the unity and the oneness of the person of Christ and of the Trinity overall, right? And so, so this is what we know so far. And this is kind of my summary of those two really important documents, one by Irenaeus, proof of the apostolic preaching or demonstration of the apostolic teaching, and then the other one by Clement of Alexandria, which basically says a lot of the same stuff. Uh, okay, I'm just going to close with a couple of thoughts. The first is that, you know, we can see as doctrine develops here into the late second century, we can see it playing out what I said when I introduced my three laws, that, that these laws are observations of how doctrine develops. And the first law is that heresy forces orthodoxy to define itself. And we see this happening uh, first with the apostolic fathers or the, that, that first generation of, of leaders, bishops, and theologians after the apostles. Then we see it in the, in the apologists, the, those philosophers who are teaching Christianity as a philosophy and defending it to outsiders. And now we're seeing it with the first theologians. Clement of Alexandria is kind of a transitional figure. He's both an apologist and a theologian. Uh, I like to think of Irenaeus as the first true theologian, and then later we're going to get into Tertullian and Latin theology. But, um, but just to kind of give you an indication of how I, I didn't make this stuff up. This is an observation that the church fathers saw as well, even though the, the three laws are sort of uh, given in language that I came up with. Um, here's, here's just a bit from St. Augustine. This is from the City of God, and, and this is what he says, and this is an English translation from the um, Nicene Fathers, so this is not my translation. It's just uh, right out of the book, but, but this is what he says in City of God. Augustine says, For while the hot restlessness of heretics stirs questions about many articles of the Catholic faith, the necessity of defending them forces us both to investigate them more accurately and to understand them more clearly, and to proclaim them more earnestly. And the question, mooted by an adversary, becomes the occasion of instruction. That's Augustine, City of God, 16.2. So the point is, is that heresy forces orthodoxy to define itself, and by having to clarify orthodoxy, uh, that's how doctrine develops over time, and how it becomes uh, more and more clear. Um, now, finally, you know, if you're thinking, well, you know, wait a minute, let's back up a second. Why do there even have to be these boundaries between um, 
between orthodoxy and heresy. Why can't everyone just believe whatever they want and call themselves Christians? And uh, I'm going to give you two answers, a short answer and a long answer. The short answer, I think, is because souls are at stake. Because in the understanding of the early church and the church fathers, um, orthodoxy is the path to salvation. Heresy is to veer off the path. And to follow a heretical teacher is to be led away from the path to salvation. So by cracking down on heresy and clarifying it and, and, and uh, condemning it and clarifying orthodoxy, these early bishops and theologians and catechists are trying to keep everyone on the path toward salvation. So that's the short answer. Um, you can't just let everyone believe whatever they want because then people start teaching whatever they want and then people are led astray and souls are at stake. Okay, now the longer answer, not too long, but I want you to think about a club a club that I am not able to join. Their membership requirements uh, do not, uh, don't include me, let's say. And um, it's sometimes referred to as the Red Hat Club. Now, if anyone is watching and you're a member of the Red Hat Club, I mean no disrespect to this club. I am using this, uh, I'm using your club as an example out of respect because I, because I think it paints a very accurate picture of how things do need to be. So, uh, the Red Hat Club, as I understand it, is a, uh, a social club for uh, women of a certain age. That's their definition, their description. And um, as a way of identifying themselves, especially when they're out in public, they wear red hats. Now, imagine if someone were to come to the Red Hat Club and say, well, I would like to be a member of your club. And they might say, well, that's great. We would love to have you. And then that person might say, except that I don't like red hats, I want to wear a green hat. Now, at that point, the existing members, the previous members of the Red Hat Club, have every right to say, well, you know what? Our very identity is bound up in the red hat. And if we start wearing people, if we start letting people wear hats of other colors, then that's going to degrade the integrity of, of our very identity. And so therefore, we're going to have to say to you, no, you can't come in here and wear a green hat. If you'd like, maybe there's a green hat club you can join or whatever, but we're sorry, but that's our boundary. You can't come in here and wear a green hat. Now, I don't know if they would actually say that, but go with it for the analogy. Uh, but this is kind of like what's happening in the early church, because in the early church, the church fathers, those early bishops, theologians, and catechists, they literally defined what Christianity is. They defined it according to Trinitarian doctrine and Christology. So to say something else that is mutually exclusive from the way in which Christianity was historically defined is to erode the very identity of what Christianity is. And therefore, the boundaries are drawn around the Christian identity and in terms of Trinitarian faith. Now, spoiler alert, right? The, the concrete document that really draws those boundaries is going to be the Nicene Creed. So if you want to know, well, what is the very definition of Christianity? It is the Nicene Creed. And so if a person came to a church and said, well, I'd like to join your church, but I don't believe in the things in the Nicene Creed, right? The pastor of that church would have every right to say, well, you know, we'd love to have you, but that Nicene Creed is our very identity as Christians. And so it would, it would diminish our identity if we let you come in here call yourself a Christian, but not hold to the beliefs in the Nicene Creed. That would, in effect, sort of water down the very definition of what Christianity is. And the very definition of what Christianity is, is a historic definition that we have received from those who came before us, and there is no one alive today who has the right to change it. And so, like the Red Hat Club, we have to believe that the, the, the church as an organism has the right to draw boundaries around its very identity and 
demand that its members stay within those boundaries. Uh, so that's my longer answer to the question, why can't everyone just believe whatever they want and call themselves Christians? At least I'm speaking uh, as I think the church fathers would. All right, thanks for joining me for this uh, Unit 3 Highlights video, and uh, hopefully you'll come back for the next one. Hey, thanks for watching this video all the way to the end. I really appreciate that. Please share this video with your friends and please join me in the original church community on locals.com. Don't forget that if you join the original church community on locals.com, you can join me each week for a live, in-depth, chronological Bible study. It's live streamed every Saturday, but you can watch it later if you're not available. So join me for that and I'll see you there. I hope to see you there. I hope to see you there and I'll see you there.